How's it going? Welcome to this uh, week's uh, Q&A. Like any other week, if you want a chance at one of your questions being answered, make sure you do drop your comments down below with your question, and I'll get to them either in next week's video or a future video, or I'll answer the question directly or make a dedicated video towards that. So I apologize for my voice this week. I did lose my voice mid-week, and I have about 90% of it back, so I figured it should be good enough to do this video. So here we are with the video. So with that being said, let's go ahead and get started with the first question of the week. And it is, can your vo warranty be voided or denied if you do your own maintenance, if you're a DIYer and whatnot? Now, as long as you're doing your maintenance, your oil changes, your transmission services, et cetera, your fluids, uh, sparkers, whatever the case may be, they cannot void your warranty for that simple reason that you just don't service the vehicle in their dealership. They can short try it, but they have absolutely zero grounds as long as you're doing maintenance. Now, if you are doing your own maintenance, it's a good idea to keep some sort of a, a service record and receipts with those parts that you have purchased. You know, whether it be oil, filters, uh, brake pads, uh, tires, anything. It's also great for a resale value when you go sell your vehicle, right? Some people love that people have, uh, you know, all sorts of receipts, you know, from the previous owner and it shows that you maintain the vehicle and usually that helps you benefit and getting the most out of the value when you go sell your vehicle at some point. So um, again, they can't just deny something because you don't service your vehicle there and even less so if you have proof that you have maintenance records, you've done maintenance, you have receipts of those, and even if you wanna take some pictures of doing those intervals, whatever the case may be, but you shouldn't even have to go that far. And if you're, uh, let's say your turbocharger fails because of you know just whatever happened, and you can prove that you've done maintenance, you have the receipts and whatnot, there's absolutely zero reason they can't warranty that turbo for you if it falls within warrantable limits. So with that being said, hopefully that answers the question for you. So the next question is, at what mileage should you be changing your valve cover gasket or gaskets? Now, there's no set time or uh, mileage that you should be changing these things. Although, if you're going in there for any sort of reason, for instance, a valve adjustment, that would probably be a great time to change those gaskets. Anytime you take off a valve cover or anything with a rubber seal or O-ring on it, you should be replacing the gasket or O-ring or seal anyways, but especially more so at higher mileage. Now, obviously, if it's starting to leak, if it's starting to seep, that would be the right time to change it. But some of these gaskets sometimes will go 150, 250, uh, whatever, 1,000 miles. Doesn't happen very often, but it does happen depending on the conditions, you know, the heat outside, uh, driving conditions, factors, all that stuff factors into how it fails. Could be just sealed pro imp uh, improperly from factory, you know, whatever the case may be. Uh, but yeah. If you go to do any service work and you happen to have a component out and it's, you know, uh, at like 90, 100, 150,000 miles or so, I would definitely recommend it at that time. Or if it's starting to seep or leak, then obviously at that point, you would want to change out whatever gasket or seal is leaking at that point. That being said, hopefully that answers the question for you. The next question is how to identify a sticking caliper or caliper situation. So uh, a lot of times, you will eventually get a, a pulsation from either the steering wheel or the car, and you'll get kind of a jerking uh, motion, kind of like a trans judder, but without even being on the gas at all. So that would be one of the symptoms, and that's just from the caliper sticking and warping the rotor and causing that situation. Now, another uh, way you may see something is if you put the car into drive or reverse and a car doesn't inch up or in, in either direction, that would be an indication that you have a sticking caliper. Sometimes the problem is with sticking calipers, initially when they cool off, they're great. When they heat up, then they start to uh, stick and cause the caliper to seize. So really depends. Another way you could check, obviously you go and you look at the rotors. If one of them looks more brownish reddish than the other one, then chances are that caliper is either sticking or starting to stick. You could also feel excessive heat from that wheel. Obviously do not touch the rotor, but if you put your hand close to the uh, rotor or the rim, the wheel, you could probably feel it being more hot than the other sides. That would be a great indication. And lastly, you could also take a infrared gun 
and take the temperature reading on it and that would be a great indication now if it's within a couple degrees of each other it's probably not an issue or you have two or more sticking calipers now if one of them is way higher than the other three then it's possible you definitely have a sticking caliper you can also have a situation where the cart is pulling because you have excessive drag on one side and causing the cart to pull either way from that excessive drag so those are just a couple of ways you can identify a sticking caliper after that you would jack up the car you know in a safe fashion on a lift or with a jack with some jack stands underneath spin one wheel one by one and see if one of them has more resistance than the other now that could still be a uh, an issue with the pins itself and not the caliper itself although you will know at that point that you have something else going on there and if you know if it's higher mileage it'd probably be a good idea to change out that caliper and they do a brake fluid flush so hopefully it answers the question for you all right so the next question is what uh leather maintenance or conditioner do i uh, perform on my vehicles and i personally use the chemical guys leather cleaner and conditioner now i'm not a big detailing kind of guy although i do like to condition them every once in a while now if you know me you know my car i know i you know i drive with a plastic on the driver's side see i do mechanical work on a daily basis and i although i do change you never know if there's you know some sort of grease stuck on my pants on my shirt or whatnot you just never know so i take the extra precaution on the weekends i toss the plastic i put in my trunk and you know get either a new one or reuse that one on monday come monday morning when i get out of work now um, i do this every couple of uh, months i don't do it all the time obviously if something gets on the seats itself i do have red interior so red leather uh, i clean it as best as possible immediately and you know condition it afterwards or whatnot the case may be now again i am not a detailing professional uh, if anybody has any suggestions out there something different something better something with a different look uh whatever make sure you do drop a comment down below because a few people have asked me this question and like that we could all be informed as much as possible including myself so hopefully that answers the question for you last but not least question of the week and if i didn't get to your question this week i'll get to it either next week's video or i am working on a dedicated video for it so is there a loss of communication between the technician the service advisor and the customer and a lot of times absolutely and it starts at the advisors if you're an advisor don't uh, cut my head off but there are great advisors out there most of them are not great advisors and they don't even know much about cars themselves although you don't need to personally but it is a good idea and does make an advisor stronger so for example i'll get a repair order it'll say customer states has a noise all right well we've established that the customer has a noise that's great right when is the noise how often it is is the noise is it coming from the back is it coming from the front is it while driving does it increase with speed is it when it's cold out is it when it's sunny is it when it's night is it going over a driveway whatever any detailed information and all information as much as possible now um that's where the problem starts and a lot of times i'll have to go to to the advisor and i'll ask him or her and they won't even know they'll just say oh customer just has a noise a lot of times that leads to issues because i might hear something that the customer is not hearing or vice versa uh i might not hear something at all and a customer is hearing something it could be intermittent it could be all the time but you know sometimes it really depends on the situation and it could even be a normal characteristic of the car so that's problem number one so after that usually happens i like to talk to the customer personally and ask them the questions that i like to ask to try to help me identify the issue if it's not obvious if it's obvious i'll state in the, the call that this is what i'm hearing are you hearing this or i'll let them tell me what they're hearing and i'll just confirm yay or nay that's what i'm hearing um, at that point now when i'm doing a multi-point inspection when i started back in 2008 everything was handwritten and a lot of times uh, my service advisor at the time was phenomenal but a lot of times i would be there next to him and uh talking to the customer together so if the customer had any questions or if the advisor was kind of saying something that was not 100 percent correct i would you know just overstep a little bit and correct them uh, obviously advisors don't like that but it is what it is and i just don't like false information out there and i'll tell him something and not that he's doing it deliberately he just might be explaining a different way 
and just not the way I want the customer to, you know, maybe hear it or interpret it. It just might, you know, get taken the wrong way. So uh, nowadays we do a multi-point inspection video where I do a video of my findings and usually I'll address the customer issues. If it has a noise, a vibration, a check engine light, you know, whatever the case may be, and I'll address those and I'll tell them this is what we need to do um, to fix your issues. Or if there's a, a possibility that the car has a no start condition, we'll recommend a starter for instance, but I can't confirm how the engine is running because obviously we can't get the car started. So I'll say, this is what we need to do. We don't know what kind of condition the engine is in. If any issues arise after that, then we'll have to proceed with our diagnostics from there. And nine out of 10 people are more than okay with that. And at that point, the customer gets that direct video. And uh, sometimes they'll say, well, that's not what the te technician said in a video versus what you're telling me. And that's why I like the video. Not only does it cover me, um, sometimes, again, there's a loss of translation and that video kind of helps gap that loss of translation. So um, if your service department or your dealer doesn't have multi-point inspection videos, then they're probably missing out on not only uh, selling, upselling more work, but getting the customer customer's concern uh, fixed correctly. And a lot of times if it's a customer pay uh, job for something they're not even there for, just something I saw, I can show them whether it's ball joint play or oil leak and customers appreciate that. A lot of times they may not know what's going on, what they're looking at, right? But they do see an oil leak. And I'll always invite them to the back. Hey, if you want me to show you the part after I replace it, or if you need more detailed information, you're here in the building, you know, feel free to ask the advisor. I'll show you. And, you know, as, as long as there's that trust with you and the customer and the advisor, everybody's on the same page. Uh, even if it may be a car that's not going to be, you know, you know, just clear cut and dry of a repair. And there's might be some sort of an issue uh, and you have to take steps. Uh, they do appreciate that. And as long as you're being honest with them from the beginning, uh, I find that that's a huge uh, bonus and a huge plus. And they usually understand 99 of 100 times. You can't please everybody, but that usually works at everybody's favor. Everyone's on the same page. There's video evidence. They can't say, hey, you never told me this because we'll go back to the video. Be like, bam, here it is right here. So, um, yeah. Uh, but to answer the question, absolutely. There's a lot of times that there's a lost communication and you should have that trust with that company, that mechanic, that advisor, uh, you know, whatever the case may be, the dealer. And that works out the best for everyone. So hopefully that answers the question for you. And I'll catch everyone on the next one.